Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2015 edition of the Royal Tyrol Museum Speaker Series. Today, the Royal Tyrol Museum and its cooperating society are proud to present Dr. John Huffecker. John is a researcher at the Institute of Arctic and Alpine Research from the University of Colorado at Boulder. John was born in Great Britain, but was raised in the northeastern United States. He pursued his bachelor's degree in archaeology at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. John then moved to Alaska to pursue a master's degree in anthropology at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. During his years in Alaska, he studied the local archaeology and conducted fieldwork in the North Alaska Range. After completing his master's degree, John moved to Chicago to pursue his PhD at the University of Chicago, where he studied the Upper Paleolithic of the East European Plain. While writing his PhD, John began working at the Argonne National uh, Laboratory, a position he held until the late 1990s. Subsequently, John moved to the Institute of Arctic and Alpine Research at the University of Colorado Boulder and shifted the focus of his work in Eastern Europe to the Central Plain. John has conducted numerous large-scale research projects, including studies of the famous Kostenki Upper Paleolithic sites near Voronezh in Russia, of late prehistoric settlements in the Seward Peninsula in Alaska, and of Paleolithic sites on the East European Plain. John has written several books on Eastern Europe and the Circumpolar Zone, books that reflect his interest in the development of human adaptations to northern environments and in the dispersal of anatomically modern humans, especially in northern Eurasia and Beringia. John's presentation today reflects the integration of the seemingly unrelated research themes he has pursued since his undergraduate days and the fieldwork in central Alaska during the 1970s. So without further delay, I present you Dr. John Hofecker. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Um, I, the focus of my talk today is, um, is Beringia and its role in the, the peopling of the Americas. And specifically, I'm going to talk about this idea that Beringia was not simply a bridge from Asia to North America that was crossed at the end of the last ice age about 15,000 years ago but was, was also, and perhaps more importantly, was a refugium for a rather large human population for an extended period of time during the coldest period of the last ice age, the so-called last glacial maximum, which starts about 25,000 years ago, and that this population, at least a few thousand people, then became the nucleus, became the source of most of the Native American populations that are around today. Um, this doesn't include the more recent arrivals, like the Inuit, the Nadine, but it includes most of the so-called Amerindian population spread throughout uh, mid-latitude North America and South America. But I'm going to do something that I've never done before, and which I don't believe any of my colleagues have done, and that is I'm going to try to put Beringia into the wider context of the global dispersal of, of anatomically modern humans, Homo sapiens, ourselves. Uh, modern humans evolved within the last 200,000 years, in sub-Saharan Africa, it's starting to look like somewhere in southern Africa, southwestern Africa, rather than east Africa, as had been thought to be the case for some time, and then subsequently dispersed out of Africa, um, perhaps uh, no more than about 60,000 years ago, into the rest of, of the world, initially into Eurasia, and then, and then and into Australia very quickly after that, and then eventually into the, into the New World. Um, the, this is a map that was put together by Spencer Wells of the Genographic Project run by the National Geographic Society, and it depicts the, uh, both the maternal and the paternal lineages. The maternal lineages are based on mitochondrial DNA that's passed from the mother to the daughter. The paternal lineages uh, can be traced through the Y chromosome, through the non-recombining portions of the Y chromosome, which are passed on from father to son. And, um, the, we can, everybody on the earth today, of course, belongs to one of these lineages, and we can trace them all back to, to Africa, to southern Africa. And this map that uh, Wells put together here depicts the, um, the uh, maternal lineages in uh, orange, or it's coming out, I guess, sort of orange is brown on this, on this screen here, and the paternal lineages in blue. Now, there's a, um, the, 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 uh, the times in which these various lineages diverge from each other can be estimated by looking at uh, key substitutions, 
within the lineages. Um, this is specifically is a tree that's been put together relatively recently with a new calibration of the ages of the various maternal lineages, that is the mitochondrial DNA. And uh, the exodus out of Africa here, beginning about 70,000 years ago, L3 is the, that's the last, um, that's the, the parent group, African parent group, of all of us who are non-Africans. Everybody's either an African or a subset of the African population. And I think as I see most people in this room look like they're part of the subset here, like myself. And so we belong to either one of these three lineages or of the various sub-lineages that diverge from these at later times. There are three major early lineages that pop up here um, at the beginning of the dispersal out of Africa. They are uh, M, N, and R. And then the others all eventually diverge from these. Um, now, the, if it were only, if the global dispersal of modern humans were based only on these estimated times of divergence, uh, again, based on the, the sub, key substitutions uh, in the mitochondrial genome or in the Y chromosome genome, um, I'm sure we'd, you know, we'd still be arguing about this quite a bit here in paleoanthropology because, of course, we can't be absolutely sure uh, that these substitutions are taking place you know, on a regular basis every 100 years or so. But we have a very important uh, source of information that allows us to ground truth uh, the genetic model, and that is uh, ancient DNA that is extracted, can be extracted from dated fossil remains uh, of, of modern humans. And we have, this is a um, figure, I, have, I don't believe anybody else has put together a figure like this, um, it's kind of a work in progress because as the months go on, I'm able to add new stuff here. And I've, since Francois saw this last year, I've added a couple of things because there have been some major new discoveries here, especially um, from Western Siberia here. But this allows us to uh, then to check the, uh, our, the model that's based on the um, reconstructed divergence of these lineages uh, from the substitu various substitutions. It allows us to see if, if indeed, uh, for instance, um, you know, this haplogroup U is showing up when it's supposed to show up 40,000 years ago uh, in this part of Europe. Um, and I've, I've followed uh, Wells' color coding here, so the, the blue ones here are, the, are paternal lineages and the, the, uh, the brown ones are the, um, are the maternal lineages. Okay, now, you would think that that the genetic, uh, many of my colleagues seem to be convinced that this is all largely an argument about the genetics, but actually the beginning, uh, the, the original basis of this idea of a recent African origin for all modern humans, this so-called out of Africa model, um, began in a very traditional way, and that is with dated fossil remains uh, in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa. It goes back to 1967 when Richard Leakey uh, discovered this skull uh, at Omo here, this is in southern Ethiopia here in the Omo River Valley. And uh, everyone, it was, it's a modern looking skull and everyone was amazed when it uh, dates turned up initially of uh, about 130,000 years. Uh, more recently it's been dated to uh, somewhat, uh, even older, uh, close to 200,000 years. Um, but the pattern the fossil remains um, is fairly straightforward. We have the earliest dated remains of anatomically modern human people in Africa, in East Africa and in South Africa. And then outside Africa, uh, when we're able to date uh, materials here, uh, they're always younger. They're always less, they're, they're always less than 60,000 years, as we will see. Uh, and of course, much younger than that over here in the New World, where they're all less than, than 15,000 years. So that's another you know, helpful you know, kind of way of ground truthing the, the timing and the routes of the dispersal. Um, and then we turn to the archaeological data. My field actually is, is archaeology, as Francois mentioned, and um, the archaeological data, I think, contribute uh, very, um, or major, make a major contribution to our understanding of, of the global dispersal of modern humans for a number of reasons. First of all, uh, the fossil record uh, and ancient DNA are, uh, you know, these are very rare finds. Uh, most of the record of the global dispersal is based on archaeological remains. And um, so the archaeological, uh, the artifact assemblages then become a proxy for uh, modern humans as they spread throughout Eurasia, Australia, and so forth. Um, the archaeological remains also uh, tell us um, about the various technological innovations that were, I think, essential to the success and certainly the speed 
uh, of this global dispersal. Um, and they also provide information on, on, on diet and ecology and so forth, um, which in turn, some of which in turn uh, have implications for the, for the technology. Um, the reason why this is an issue is because the global dispersal of modern humans is really an unprecedented event in Earth history. Um, there may be, I don't know, there may be some invertebrates or some bacteria that have, that have dispersed this quickly into uh, so many different climate zones and habitats, but I think certainly among vertebrates, uh, I can't think of anything that spreads this quickly within really a few thousand years for, for Eurasia uh, into so many different habitats. Everything from boreal forests to uh, deciduous woodlands to tropical margins, rain forests, um, desert margins I mean, rain forests, um, virtually everything uh, except maybe the driest areas of, of North Africa and Australia. Um, and I think the key to this, while we have, we have uh, some evidence, and we have good reason to believe that organizational adaptations were important, at least in some places, particularly where resources were very widely scattered and sometimes difficult to predict. Um, and we see evidence for long-distance transport of materials and so forth. And the implication is, is that we have the, the creation and the maintenance of, of these large alliance networks over large areas. Um, and, so that, and that may have been critical. To, to certain areas, but, one, but we, we know beyond a reasonable doubt, we know that these, um, these technological innovations such as insulated clothing, artificial shelters, um, these uh, technologies for hunting and trapping, uh, throwing darts, nets, um, the, the, the technology for expanding the human dietary niche beyond just large mammals and plants uh, to all smaller vertebrates, um, birds, fish, and so forth. Um, these undoubtedly were critical to the dispersal, and again, especially to the, to the speed with which the dispersal takes place. And they're of a, a special interest to me. That's, that's really the, the focus of, of my research. Um, now, despite all this uh, inventiveness and so forth, um, I think cli climate is still playing a, a significant role in the dispersal and the timing and the, and the routes of the dispersal. Um, climate was um, if we look, this is a correlation here between the Antarctic and the, the Greenland ice sheets. And uh, as you can see here, between 65 and uh, 25,000 years ago, there was considerable oscillation here in the climate. And I draw your attention especially to, well, okay, the numbers in the bottom here refer to what are uh, the Greenland interstadials, uh, which are numbered one through whatever it is. And I call your attention to... Um, Greenland Interstadial 12 in particular, um, which appears to be a, a, a period of sustained and, and substantial warmth here, that seems to have played a major role in the dispersal of modern humans in, in northern Eurasia, as we'll see, into some of the colder, drier areas of, of the northern latitudes. Um, and let's see. And these, uh, these are cold periods up here, the so-called Heinrich events. Um, Heinrich event four being uh, also having, I think, a big impact on the initial occupation of northern Eurasia. I think some er a number of areas, I think, were abandoned at this time and then reoccupied uh, afterwards in, a, in rather dramatic fashion. Um, okay, so we turn to the dispersal itself. Um, this is a, these are the um, again the mitochondrial uh, DNA uh, lineages of the maternal lineages here. Um, the dispersal is widely believed to have begun here uh, on the South Arabian Peninsula and involved a, a, a relatively rapid movement here into Southern Asia and Southeast Asia and then very quickly into Australia. Um, this um, lineage M, you may recall from uh, the earlier slide here, is one of the basal groups that's connected um, to L3 in Africa here. And it's very widespread even today here in Southern Asia and Southeast Asia, despite the fact there have been many you know, later, more recent population movements, particularly with the paternal lineages um, in that part of the world. Um, but nevertheless, it seems to be kind of a marker for the, the beginning of the dispersal in the, in the south, in the southern latitudes. Um, but the, we have, let me go back here for a sec. We have, there are a number of sites from uh, India in particular that are believed to date to as much as 70,000 or even more than 70,000 years ago and have been um, put forward as, as um, uh, traces of, uh, purported traces of, of this initial dispersal into uh, southern Asia. But they're very controversial and there's this big argument that's raging in the pages of nature uh, here for the last couple of years uh, about this. Um, and I think, I guess I'm among the skeptics here. I'm not sure that the 
of the uh, artifact assemblages that have been put forward as evidence of modern humans down here about 75,000 years ago are, um, uh, they're certainly ambiguous, let me put it that way. Um, the real evidence we have for uh, this very early dispersal um, for something, you know, something well below, before 50,000 years ago comes from, uh, comes from Australia. Um, and um, I call your attention here to this uh, excellent website that I stumbled across just a few months ago. It was put together by um, an Ash University here. And it's this interactive website. It's really neat. You can play around with this here. And what I've done is I've just kind of uh, printed the screen here. I set sea level uh, to about 55,000 years ago. And uh, this, uh, the map shows you where sea, le where sea level, uh, uh, where the coastlines were 50,000 years ago with lowered sea levels down about about 70 meters here. Um, and during that period, uh, as indeed for much of the, the last ice age here, um, Australia was joined to New Guinea um, by this plain here. Uh, and also, you can't really see it down here, but it was uh, also joined to Tasmania in the south. And uh, this is referred to as um, the continent of Sahul uh, when, it's all, when it's all one here. And um, we have evidence for. Um, uh, a, a number of, of sites that are they're now firmly dated to 50,000 years or even slightly earlier than 50,000 years ago. Uh, and they're interior sites. They're not even coastal sites here. Um, we assume that the, the, the first occupants of, of Southeast Asia and also Sahul uh, were um, maritime people. Even, even with the lowest levels of uh, the ocean, there's still at least 80 kilometers of open water that has to be crossed to get from, uh, any, uh, from one of these major islands here, uh, like East Timor, over to um, Sahul. So we know, beyond any reasonable doubt, these people had you know, some kind of uh, boating technology, had, uh, you know, some rafts, or maybe something more sophisticated than that, um, and probably had developed some kind of a coastal adaptation, fishing, whatever. There's even some evidence for uh, early development of fishing, freshwater fishing, and also marine fishing uh, in it back in Africa more than 70,000 years ago. So that might make a lot of sense. Um, what fascinates me about these early sites in, in Sahul is that, um, particularly uh, over here in, in eastern New Guinea in the Ivane Valley, um, this is not only an interior adaptation. This is the, there are sites here that are, that are at least 50,000 years old. Um, they are found up in the, uh, in the highlands of eastern New Guinea, 2,000 meters above sea level. And um, the technology involves these big uh, cutting tools, look like axes or whatever. It looks as though maybe these people were clearing areas of the forest in order to encourage new growth. Um, in other words, it's, a, it's, a, it's obviously a well-entrenched interior adaptation. And here it is 50,000 years ago. So what is that, how, you know, how much, how long did it take these people to develop this? And then there are these sites down here, at, at Lake Mungo, for instance, um, which are uh, completely different. There are a desert margin. These are people living around lakes, both here and at uh, Parn Um uh, Again, very, uh, a very well-developed uh, interior operation underway here. Uh, the implication is, is that the, the initial settlement of Australia or Sahul was, was considerably earlier than 50,000 years ago. Um, now. One of the most fascinating things about uh, all this is the, um, the pattern in the genetics of, of modern peoples, of the, the Papua New Guineans and Australians, as well as the other people living in Southeast Asia. Um, ancient DNA appears to preserve only in cold climates. Uh, we don't have any credible, at least not anymore, we don't have any credible examples of ancient DNA that's been extracted from human remains in the tropical zone. Um, so we don't have any ancient DNA to tell us about the timing, uh, the routes, and the lineages involved here in order to confirm or to test the ground truth, the genetic model regarding various lineages and when they show up in this part of the world. But what we do have is we have ancient DNA from the Neanderthals in Europe and also from a closely related group, group that was closely related to the Neanderthals, known as the Denisovans in the Altai region of Siberia. And what we, what we, the pattern that we see here is that all non-Africans are carrying about 2% Neanderthal genes. There is interbreeding that went on between modern humans and Neanderthals, apparently from Neanderthals to modern humans, not the other way around, uh, at the beginning of the dispersal. 
Africans do not carry any of this stuff. Um, but all Eurasians, all non-Africans carry some, including all Native Americans, carry about 2% Neanderthal DNA. The Australians uh, and, the, and the New Guineans, the Pap Papua New Guineans, also carry about 4% Denisovan DNA. So there apparently also was interbreeding with a local non-modern form of human somewhere here in Southeast Asia. Uh, and there is a little of the Denisovan uh, DNA shows up in these people kind of around the fringes here of New Guinea and Australia, nothing on the Asian mainland. It looks like the Australians and uh, the Papuans uh, are part of the of a slightly earlier group of people, modern humans, who were in Southeast Asia, who met up with these Denisovans. Again, named for a bone in Siberia, uh, which apparently reflects a much wider, more widely distributed uh, non-modern population here that was present at the time that modern humans first came into Asia. Uh, and then, presumably, these groups, as early as they are, again, we've got some very, uh, in terms of the genetics, we have some very early haplogroups here in, in Southeast Asia, particularly among groups like the Andaman Islanders and also the Samang, some of these uh, uh, recent hunter-gatherer peoples here in India, and particularly Southeast Asia. Um, and, um, and, and so, this, so, so the ancient DNA is actually is helping us out uh, with the southern dispersal, and I think it's just kind of fascinating. Um, I think the real question is, is how, this, how the Denisovan bone, it's a young girl, how it got up here in a cave in the Altai region. Because as we'll see, there's no traces of Denisovan DNA among the earliest people who show up in northern Eurasia, modern humans. Uh, it's only showing up down here in, South, in Australia, New Guinea, and again, this is kind of a secondary effect here appears. Um, so anyway, that is a fascinating part of the story. Now, turning to technology, um, we have very little evidence, other than the implication of watercraft, we have very little evidence for any new fancy technologies here associated with the southern dispersal. Um, one of the few exceptions to this um, is reported by Sue O'Connor, who has a special interest in, in technological innovations connected with the southern dispersal. She's kind of doing the same thing down here that I'm doing up in northern Eurasia. And uh, O'Connor reported just quite recently, uh, just last year, um, this uh, rather unusual looking, it looks, like a, it looks like a bone point here that's got some kind of elaborate hafting mechanism here for inserting it into, into some kind of a shaft. Uh, this is a little bit younger. It's only 35,000 years ago. It's showing up on East Timor. But at least it, it's, uh, you know, uh, some evidence that, uh, you know, we have some, some novel and some complex technology showing up uh, in association with the early settlement of of southern Asia, so it's of particular interest to me. Okay, so we turn to the north then. Look at northern Eurasia and the northern dispersal. Um, this is a bone, uh, again, this is very recent. This was just published last year. A bone, a, fem a femur that was recovered from uh, the Irtish River uh, in western Siberia, downstream from the city of Tomsk. Um, and uh, it's, been, it's a source of enormous amount of, of information. Um, it reminds me of, I think it's in Hound of the Baskervilles. When uh, doesn't Dr. Mortimer leave his walking stick at 221B Baker Street? And then Holmes and Watson are, uh, the next morning, they're looking at this walking stick, and they're coming up with various deductions that they can make on the basis of the walking stick. Of course, poor Watson comes up with two or three rather feeble observations. Then Holmes immediately has a long list of very elaborate and always seem to me somewhat problematic uh, deductions from Mortimer's walking step. But anyway, I, the, 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 this bone from, from, it's called from Ust Ishim is the name of the location here. The Ust Ishim bone kind of reminds me of Mortimer's walking stick because it's um, been a source of all kinds of, of information. First of all, it's 45,000 years old. Um, that's those are ultra-filtrated uh, radiocarbon dates. Those are good radiocarbon dates that were run in Oxford last year. Um, so it's, uh, the, it's the earliest modern human that we have from this part of the world. Uh, it's um, uh, Ustashim is about 57 degrees north latitude. Again, this is West Siberia. Uh, I checked on the local uh, weather there. The mean January temperature in that area is 15 below zero centigrade. So it's, uh, it's definitely a cold area. Remember, these are people coming quite recently out of the southern latitudes here. Um, it's, it's mitochondrial 
a DNA haplogroup or maternal lineage R. Um, that's interesting. This is this map which was put together by this guy Bay and a few years ago. Notice we, R is not up here, so we're going to have to add that to the list here. So this is a, this is a very rapidly developing uh, field here, as you can see. Um, R is also shows up in Europe. Um, there it is over there. It should, it's also showing up in southern Europe, um, I know, and it may represent uh, a very widespread um, population, um, a so-called metapopulation that the geneticists have been talking about for the last few years that may have been the initial uh, spread of modern humans across the northern part of, of Eurasia. Um, the paternal lineage is K. That's also a fairly early one, although not quite as early as R. Um, the, um, one of the most interesting things about um, the Ustashim femur is that, first of all, there's no close connection with any of the, of the southern lineages, like M, or any of these people like the Andaman Islanders, who are thought to be remnants, or the Australians, who are thought to be remnants of the initial dispersal. And this is interesting because uh, for some years, many of my colleagues have been pushing this model that has people dispersing into southern Asia and then coming around and back on the uh, uh, north of the Himalayan plateau uh, into uh, C Central Asia and also into, eventually into Europe. Um, the Ustashim femur uh, does not support that model. There's no connection here with the South. This is somebody who's connected, who connects back here with uh, these um, groups, um, uh, the, the northern groups, okay, from the Near East, from the Levant maybe, but not from, from Southern Asia. And there's no trace of the Denisovans which is a big surprise because, again, you're wondering, you know, if, 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 if all these people come out of Africa are interbreeding with the Neanderthalers somewhere around here, then why, if, we, if there's a population of non-moderns up here in Siberia, then why aren't the, the first people, first moderns who are coming into uh, Western Siberia, why aren't they showing uh, traces of the, of the Denisovans? Um, so it's, it's, it's significant from that perspective as well. Um, the other thing is that the, uh, in terms of stable nitrogen isotopes, the values are very high. They're over 14. And um, this probably indicates a heavy emphasis on freshwater aquatic foods, um, very different from the Neanderthalers or, for that matter, from the Denisovans. Um, uh, it, it, again, this has implications, I think, for the technology. Uh, it probably reflects the development of new technologies, maybe some complex technologies, fish weirs, nets, this kind of stuff, uh, for obtaining large quantities of, of freshwater aquatic foods. It needn't necessarily be fish. It could also be water birds, um, which, again, require some, some, uh, some new technologies that we don't think the Neanderthalers had. So that's interesting as well. Um, we also have a new, uh, we have some new um, finds from uh, the Levant. Um, this was published just two months ago. This is um, this new modern skull from Manic Cave in northern Israel, western Galilee. It's dated by uranium thorium. Uh, they dated this calcite uh, concretion here on the skull um, to, an, it, it, it's about 55,000 years old. It's the earliest um, modern human remain outside of Africa. Um, and uh, it suggests um, fairly early presence of modern humans here in the Levant, but earlier than some people thought. Um, so it's of great interest. It was not associated with <coughs> any artifacts, however. Um, and um, so we're still wondering exactly what the artifacts were like that were made by modern humans. Um, the suspicion now is uh, that the, um, the, first, the first group of artifacts recurring set of artifacts that spreads across northern Eurasia is something that shows up in the Levant, uh, in Israel, and also especially at this site, Kassara Kill, uh, in south Lebanon here, um, and is referred to uh, more often than not as the initial Upper Paleolithic. And it is associated with remains that were thought to be Neanderthal a few years ago, but have been reassessed as being, at the very least, being problematic, if not modern humans. In any case, the dating of that uh, skull from Menno Cave suggests that, um, that, prob that modern humans were certainly around uh, at this time, if not earlier. Um, the initial Upper Paleolithic is characterized by these um, very, um, th these typical uh, so-called uh, so Laval with flakes and points here, this um, inverted Y pattern. It's very characteristic here. Uh, and then a number of tools that are um, fairly typical of modern humans uh, in the European Upper Paleolithic, end scrapers and burins, things like that. Um, 
And this stuff um, appears to spread all across uh, northern Eurasia. Um, the initial Upper Paleolithic, or something very much like it, is um, showing up uh, in, in Eastern Europe. It's showing up especially in, in, South, in the Balkans here, and in places like Moravia, and even southern Poland. Um, <clears throat> but there is a very similar stuff showing up here in Central Asia, at a cave called Albia Rakhmak, and then also in, out here in a number of sites in Siberia, Denisova Cave for one, also uh, another site called Karabom. And it's even showing up in, in North China. So this may be the archaeological proxy here for um, the so-called metapopulation, uh, which again may turn out to be a maternal haplogroup or maternal lineage R. We'll, we'll have to see here. There's no uh, clear association at this point, but it, it does seem to, to fit in terms of the, of the timing. Um, this is uh, the uh, dating and the spread of the initial Upper Paleolithic is of particular interest to me. I work, as Francois said, I work um, in Eastern Europe. Um, I've worked in Alaska in the past and again recently. Um, but most of my work in the last um, 25 years has been in Eastern Europe in both uh, Russia and Ukraine. And a couple summers ago, I was working at a site um, in southern Russia. It's not far from the city of Volgograd uh, called Shyak. And uh, we've got some new dates. We did, uh, did a new strat stratigraphic profile here, and we got some new dates uh, from the uh, archaeological horizons down here, which uh, seem to be dating to at least about 35,000, maybe, maybe somewhat older. And they contain typical examples of this uh, initial Upper Paleolithic stuff. So it may, Schlock may be a good example of this stuff showing up here on the uh, East European plain. Um, the interesting thing about the initial Upper Paleolithic is that it seems to be spreading across northern Eurasia uh, during this very warm period I mentioned before, the Greenland Interstadial 12. So there's, there seems to be a significant association with um, the, um, this warm climate interval. And the other thing is that there's virtually no evidence for any of these technological innovations I was talking about. We don't have any evidence for um, insulated clothing in the form of, of eye needles, for example. Um, we don't have uh, any evidence for this expansion of diet to you know, birds, fish, that kind of thing that, um, um, that implies, uh, again, um, various technological innovations connected with um, harvesting of, of smaller vertebrates. Um, and uh, it's a puzzle, because um, even during this, this warm interval here, um, if these people were living in places like the East European Plain, they certainly were exposed to winter temperatures of you know, well below zero degrees centigrade. And so I don't see how they could have been, they couldn't have been there year round anyway, um, you know, without uh, some, particularly some of this technology for dealing with cold, low winter temperatures. And remember again, these are people that are coming uh, out of the southern latitudes. Uh, we know from slightly younger skeletal remains that anatomically, they were adapted to tropical climates. They're tall and thin. They've got ex long forearms and long uh, uh, tibia. Um, they're, um, they're, you know, they're classic uh, tropical adapted people. They look like they walked out of the upper Nile Valley. And we find remains, we find skeletal remains like this, a little bit younger, about 36, 38,000 years, in places like central Russia, I mean, near, near Moscow. So um, uh, they had not only do I suspect they would have had to have had um, some, some more sophisticated technology for dealing with these low winter temperatures, but they would have been especially susceptible to hypothermia, frostbite, cold injury um, because of their anatomy. Um, so anyway, it's a puzzle, and this is something that, that, um, that of course, we're working on. Um, now, at, about, at some point about 45,000 years ago, uh, we have evidence for what may be a kind of a second wave of uh, modern humans uh, coming into northern Eurasia. Again, this seems to start in the Levant here, uh, but this time uh, the archaeology, um, the, the characteristic um, archaeological assemblages are found only uh, in Europe, in Eastern Europe and also in, in, in southern, southwestern Europe and, and south central Europe. Um, this stuff is um, in the Levant, it's, 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 it's referred to as the early Akmarian. And this stuff shows up above the initial Upper Paleolithic here at Kassarak Hill and also a number of other key sites um, in the Levant. And it looks quite different. It, it involves production of these little bladelets and these, sh these sharp little points here. Um, 
it's, it's very characteristic. In this case, uh, there's no question we're talking about modern humans. There's associated with some modern fossils referred to as the Egbert uh, skeleton here or, or skull uh, from Kassara Kill. And uh, it shows up, this stuff seems to be showing up uh, again in some sites that I've worked at in the past. Um, back in the 90s, I worked in the Northern Caucasus uh, with uh, Lubov Golovanova, uh, my Russian colleague. Uh, we worked at Mesmyska Cave, which has since become quite famous because the most complete set of Neanderthal remains from Eastern Europe uh, turned up at Mesmyska Cave. And also, it was only the second uh, example of, of ancient DNA that was extracted from Neanderthal remains comes from Mesmyska Cave. It's about 1,300 meters above sea level here in the northwestern Caucasus. Um, it's quite a fascinating site, really. Amazingly good preservation. But anyway, we have in this layer that's, um, these dates are a little old. I actually ran them at my institute um, about 20 years ago, and um, I suspect they're probably a little bit young. But anyway, we have dates of at least um, about 38,000 here for this stuff, and it, it looks very similar to the early Akmarian from the Levant. And uh, my Russian colleagues are, are re relatively comfortable uh, about calling it Akmarian. Um, but the real gem from uh, this layer, it's layer 1C at Mesmyska Cave, uh, is this eyed needle, uh, which actually came up during a season when I wasn't there. I missed out on this, unfortunately. It's the oldest eyed needle that we have in Europe. It might be the oldest eyed needle in the world. There's an early eyed needle from Denisova Cave, which actually has even older dates on it. But um, it's, um, I find it's, the stratigraphic context is a little bit um, problematic. There may have been some mixing some cryoturbation. Um, but anyway, for Europe, this is the earliest eyed needle we have. So this is, is pretty good evidence for insulated, tailored clothing. So I think, that's, I think it's very significant. And in fact, this is part of a pattern that we see in other sites that we would assign to the Akmarian, or it, it's called the proto ordination in, in parts of Europe. Um, uh, this is when we start to see all this evidence for these technological innovations. Um, at Kostjanki, which is where I've worked and, and might work again here on the Don River, this is near the city of Voronezh in Russia, um, there's a whole group of sites there, remarkable sites really, some of the most amazing sites in the world, I think. Um, we have, again, something that looks kind of similar to this, not, not, quite this, not quite as similar as the stuff from Esmyska K, but anyway, we do have these little bladelets and some points here. Um, and the, the, the age is, is, is uh, the dating is, is, is early. It, um, this stuff underlies a volcanic tephra horizon, a volcanic ash that was deposited uh, almost exactly 40,000 years ago. The source area, amazingly enough, being southern Italy, um, there was this immense eruption, the so-called Companion uh, Ignimbrite, which created this enormous ash plume that spread across southern Europe, southeastern Europe, and eastern Europe. And shows up here over a thousand kilometers um, downrange from uh, the Bay of Naples uh, on the Don River at Kaschanki, uh, and is a very is a very reliable chronostratigraphic marker for us. Um, underneath the ash, then, in addition to um, this Akmarian looking stuff, uh, we have um, all kinds of stuff here. We have um, we've got some uh, antler mattocks here. We've got uh, awls. Um, we actually don't have any eyed needles. Those come from slightly younger levels, but you know we might. May find them eventually. Um, we have indirect evidence for um, snares and traps in the form of these large concentrations of hair remains, some of which have um, actually have little um, cut marks on them from tools. Um, but these occur in large concentrations. Um, like there's about 1,500 of them uh, from the same level, all in in in, in, in a, a small area, um, which seem to suggest um, large scale harvesting, industrial scale harvesting of of, of these kinds of animals. Um, and, and again, that that's would seem to imply traps or snares or, or nets at least. Um, now, in uh, in northern Asia, over in Siberia, at about the same time, um, we see a, a, a rather different looking industry emerging. And it looks it looks as though um, this may be the um, the split which the geneticists have been telling us for a long time takes place fairly early between the East Asian population and the West Eurasians. Remember I mentioned there's this, appears to be this meta-population that represents this, in, this initial spread of modern humans uh, maybe as much as 50,000 years ago across northern Eurasia. But then it seems not long afterwards we start to see um, a very distinct uh, Asian uh, industry in terms of the, of the archaeology. And we also have from uh, Tenyuan Cave, which is near Beijing, we actually have some ancient DNA uh, from this, um, from the Tenyuan cave skeleton, or 
most of a skeleton, dates to at least 40,000 years ago. And it's haplogroup B, uh, which is a classic Asian haplogroup, something that's not common in, in Western Eurasia. Uh, and also, also common in the New World, by the way. Um, so this may be the, the beginning of the, of the big split here. Um, what we see, and finally getting to Beringia here, um, a few thousand years later, presumably by descendants of these people who were living in southern Siberia at that time, we see the first occupation of the Arctic and of Beringia itself. Um, there is a remarkable group of sites that were discovered in 2002 by my colleague Vladimir Petulko in St. Petersburg. Uh, turns out there's now there's a whole group of sites up there, about six of them, near the mouth of the Anna River. Um, this, is well, this is about latitude 73 degrees north, so it's well in the Arctic. It's in a region that today experiences extreme low winter temperatures. I mean, we're talking about January means of, of below 30 uh, degrees below zero. Uh, and these sites are, they're amazing. They're, they're, they're filled because the, the, the sediments are, are, are frozen. Uh, it's like a good Arctic site. Uh, it's producing all kinds of organic material. Uh, these ivory vessels, uh, particularly amazing here. We don't have anything like this from the European early uh, Upper Paleolithic or even the later Upper Paleolithic. Um, we have needles. Uh, we have all kinds of other fancy stuff here. Um, so it's what we would expect. It's a high-tech uh, hunter-gatherer interior adaptation in the Arctic, uh, at least 30,000 years old. Uh, and it's within what is normally defined as, as Beringia. The, the definition of Beringia most commonly uh, holds that the Verhoyansk range or the Lena River is the western, the western boundary. So Beringia then is everything between, between the Verhoyansk range and the, uh, the, either the McKenzie River or sometimes people talk in terms of the um, Laurentide Ice Sheet uh, of the last glacial maximum is the eastern boundary. Um, we also have uh, from uh, the Seward Peninsula, from an area near where I worked a few years ago, uh, right near the village of Deering, we have this worked mammoth tusk here, which dates to about 40,000 calibrated years ago, um, which clearly has been cut here. Um, the, um, the folks who looked at, uh, published this, Ben Potter and his colleagues from Fairbanks, um, were very conservative and suggested, well, you know, probably this was, uh, it was in a frozen silt bank and, Somebody picked it up maybe within the last thousand years or so and, and cut, cut some enamel off the, the surface of the tusk here, very much the same way that people were doing this during the Upper Paleolithic. Um, but it, it, it's at least, I, I suppose, possible evidence that we have somebody over here on the other side of Beringia, in eastern Beringia, um, before the last glacial maximum uh, at about the, roughly the same time that people were, were in western Beringia. What we'll have to see. Um, a key point here is that it would appear that um, access to the rest of the New World was completely blocked at this time. Um, until recently, I think most of us had been assuming that probably during these warmer periods, particularly you know, like 35,000, 40,000 years ago, that um, the, the so-called ice-free corridor was opening up here uh, and that maybe there was some uh, possible route along the coast as well. Uh, and that, at least in theory, people could have moved from Beringia into mid-latitude North America. The latest efforts here, uh, this is from uh, Art Dyke and others, published a paper a couple of years ago in Quaternary Science Review, um, reconstructed the Laurentide Ice Sheet and also the Cordilleran Ice Sheet here in the Northern Rockies on the basis of a computer modeling approach. Um, and this you know, may be the way to go here because it's, it's terribly difficult to reconstruct these earlier events here from dated glacial moraines and that kind of thing, particularly when all of this stuff was overridden during the last glacial maximum. Um, so the modeling approach may be the one that works here. Anyway, according to the, according to the model these guys published a couple of years ago, um, there, was, there was no access from eastern Beringia to, to mid-latitude North America, and that may, that may explain a lot. Okay, so we turn to this idea that Beringia was, was a refugium for people during the last glacial maximum. Um, this is an idea, the roots of which go back into the early 90s, um, but it was restated um, with some new data uh, less than 10 years ago by this international group of geneticists, uh, Eric Tom and others, um, most of them based in uh, Estonia, uh, but includes a, a bunch of other international colleagues. And they referred to this as the Beringia standstill model. Uh, it was based on this um, new analysis, again, uh, the mitochondrial DNA, the mtDNA data, um, they had a fairly large sample here. Um, they used a, a fairly uh, average mutation rate estimate here uh, that's neither particularly fast or slow. 
And their conclusion was that, um, that the source population for most Native Americans then was derived from this isolated population in Beringia. The genetics here actually are quite simple. Um, what they found is, is that among this actually rather large number of defining mutations or substitutions for the Native American populations, there are a large number of mutations that are widespread throughout North and South America. And that means that these mutations had to have taken place before Native Americans began to disperse all over the continents of North and South America. They had to have taken place in some, at some particular geographic um, location. And so, all right, there, the model is that Beringia then is occupied before the last glacial maximum, before 25,000 years ago. This population is then isolated somewhere here in Beringia. And then it is only after, about 15,000 years ago, that um, the population then spreads and disperses throughout <coughs> the New World. And then they also found, and this actually had been pointed out before, that we have evidence for some back migrations here, apparently out of the same source population, um, which raises an interesting question, because if there weren't people already here in Beringia before 15,000, then where are these people coming from here that are showing up back in Northeast Asia? And there's also some linguistic evidence that supports this, the so-called Nantanayan and Sayan hypothesis. Um, so anyway, that is the model. Now, the uh, OK, we looking at the, at the climate here, um, the last glacial maximum starts, as I said, about 25,000 years ago. We get this major depression in temperatures here. And it lasts for about 10,000 years. We, we start, the climate start to warm up about, about after 17,000, 16,000 years ago. Um, it has an enormous impact in the northern hemisphere, but it also, it also has an impact on the southern hemisphere. We find, that we find evidence for very arid climates in places like central Australia and also North Africa. Um, we have evidence uh, that human populations were retreating into refugia in a number of these places. We have evidence that North Africa, the Arabian Peninsula, were abandoned at this time during the last glacial maximum, that much of central Australia was abandoned at this time. And we also have particularly good evidence from Western Europe, um, <clears throat> Western and Central Europe, that human populations um, retreated to these three zones in the south here, these, the, uh, these three different uh, kind of cul-de-sacs down here, being Spain and the Balkan Peninsula uh, and also the Caucasus. And then that what we see with the, uh, the um, post-LGM um, European population then is a repopulation from these refugia groups, these groups which were then isolated for some years in these cul-de-sacs. Okay, so the idea here is that, um, that maybe Beringia was, was, a, was, a, was a refugium, just like um, these places in southern Europe. Um, we, have, we have evidence of the abandonment of much of Siberia in terms of a, a major depression in the radiocarbon dates on archaeological sites here that more or less coincides with the, the last glacial maximum peak. And the real question here is, um, if people were not in Beringia, then is there another possible place where they could have been isolated? Because it's hard to account for the genetics if we don't isolate this source population for Native Americans somewhere, somewhere between you know, the original East Asian population, the original source for all those haplogroups like A, B, C, and D, um, and the, the, native, the, the New World. Um, so if it isn't Beringia, then it has to be somebody somewhere else out here. And I guess the real question is, is how credible is Beringia as a, as a refugium for, for a population during the last glacial maximum. Now, this is kind of an interesting case here of, of compartmentalization of the various fields. Um, I found when I started talking to um, some geneticists, including some of my friends and colleagues like Dennis O'Rourke at the University of Utah, that the geneticists had no idea that um, this discussion about there being a mesic tundra refugium in central Beringia has been going on since the 1930s. It actually goes back to the very beginning um, of the definition of Beringia. Beringia was defined by a Swedish botanist named Eric Holtien in 1937. 
Um, and the reason why he coined the term was that he, he noticed that there was um, the same uh, tundra species, tundra plant species were distributed on both sides of the Bering Sea and also down here in the Aleutians. Um, he didn't think it credible that they had all evolved independently, right? And so he postulated some kind of central area from which these plant species had dispersed. Uh, and um, since uh, this, was, um, uh, this was long after people had um, already figured out that there had been uh, a land connection here between Alaska and Northeast Asia due to the lowered sea level, um, he, uh, he, he assumed that this, this area was this area now that is now underwater. Anyway, he came up, so he coined the term Beringia to, um, uh, as, the, as the original source area for all these tundra plants. And Holtain's idea was that during the warm periods, um, or during the cold periods, I'm sorry, like the last glacial maximum, these tundra plants had kind of retreated to this central and somewhat a wetter zone here in the central lowlands of Beringia, the area that's now underwater. Um, and then when uh, warmer conditions returned, these plants had dispersed uh, west and east and also south uh, from the central zone, from, from what he called Beringia. And of course, since, since Sultane, we've redefined Beringia to include this much larger area. But the original definition was just simply these areas that were inundated by um, lowered sea level. Um, but as I say, this idea that um, that Beringia supported some kind of a, central Beringia supported this, this uh, mesic tundra zone, goes back a long way. Um, there was a, a, a long uh, argument that went on beginning in the, in the late 60s and through the 70s and the 80s. I remember this very well as a grad student at the University of Alaska. Um, between the paleobotanists who were getting um, uh, all, all kinds of evidence for um, this mesic tundra zone here in Beringia, and the paleozoologists like um, Dale Guthrie at the University of Alaska who were excavating, who were looking at fossil remains, large mammal fossils from places like central Alaska, and they're also reading the Russian literature, and finding that um, contrary to um, the predictions of, of a mesic tundra, they were getting a, a dry steppe type of fauna. They were finding large quantities of steppe bison, mammoth horse, that kind of thing, steppe marmots. Uh, and so this, this argument went on for some time here between the paleozoologists and the, and the paleobotanists about whether, you know, tundra versus steppe. And uh, then it was resolved really by the, by the paleozoologists, specifically by Dale Guthrie, who went back to Holtain's original idea and suggested that um, there, had, there had indeed been a mesic tundra zone, but it was just confined to the central part of Beringia. And the reason why Guthrie came around to this idea was that he realized that there had to be some explanation for why these various steppe species like woolly rhino over in western Beringia and, um, and, uh, and these, uh, these American steppe species uh, like, um, like camel over here in eastern Beringia were, seemed unable to cross over to the other side, right? These are all stuck over here in Alaska and the Yukon, and these species are all stuck over here in Chukotka and the Kalima Basin. Uh, and so Guthrie, Guthrie came around to this idea that there was a barrier in the form of this Music shrub, shrub tundra zone. At um, the same time, uh, Scott, my, my colleague Scott Elias uh, was looking at cores that were coming out of the, originally out of the Bering Sea and then also more recently out of the Chukchi Sea and finding evidence for, uh, again, for mesic tundra environments here in terms of Elias is a, is a, a, is a paleoentomologist. He was looking at the beetle fauna. Um, and also, uh, Scott was also finding evidence for surprisingly mild temperatures. Uh, he was finding evidence of a temperature depression of only a couple degrees centigrade for the last glacial maximum, which is a big surprise for, you know, for this part of the world. Um, so this is all consistent with this idea that we, that we had a, a mesic tundra, milder uh, and wetter tundra zone in the lowlands of, of, of Beringia. And uh, actually, if you look at this here, if we look, if we put the 60 degree uh, north latitude line in here. You can see that if you're a, a human population uh, somewhere here in Eurasia, um, there are not many places to go, right, uh, during the last glacial maximum. Um, northwestern Eurasia is completely covered by um, the Scandinavian ice sheet. Uh, <clears throat> obviously, North America is completely covered by the coalesced Laurentide and Cordilleran ice sheets. This part of northern Eurasia appears to be extremely cold and dry. We have no evidence that anybody's living here at this time. 
And it's only South Central Beringia here that would have been exposed to some source of moisture coming from the normal clockwise circulation here um, uh, in, the, in the northern Pacific. Um, so it does make sense here in terms of, in terms of the climate modeling for the last glacial maximum. You would have at least somewhat milder temperatures here. And the point here, it comes down to this. If a human population is not going to be, if they're not going to hang out here, an isolated population that's cut off from the rest of the Asian groups, if they're not here, where are you going to put these people where they're not going to wind up mingling with um, the other Eurasian groups during the last glacial maximum? And I think that's what it comes down to. If we can find another credible refugium somewhere here in, in northern Eurasia, um, you know, then I think we, we, have some, we still have some explaining to do. But at this point, Beringia looks like the most credible place to put a few thousand people during the last glacial maximum. Um, temperatures are milder. And most importantly of all, I think, there's a source of wood in the form, particularly willow. But we also have evidence that we actually have some, uh, some pine and some spruce uh, that are um, that are living in this, um, surviving in this, this refugia in the central part of Beringia. So I think that may have been the key. OK, in terms of the archaeology, what happens here at the, after the last glacial maximum, when temperatures start to warm up after about 17, 16,000 years ago, we see a very characteristic uh, set of remains that, that are coming out of southern Siberia. <clears throat> and they show up here in the, kind of the, 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 um, the western door, southwestern door to Beringia, at a place called Duktai Cave in the Aldan Valley, which is a tributary of the Lena River, <clears throat> dated to about 15,000. It's this, these so-called wedge-shaped microblade cores. Um, and then about maybe only five, 600 years later, we see the same stuff showing up here in central Alaska at a site called Swan Point, dates to at least 14,000 years ago. That appears to be, um, and we don't have any ancient DNA here, so we can't confirm this yet, but that appears to be, based on the archaeology, the reoccupation of the north by a population that's coming out of southern Siberia. In other words, not part of this isolated population that would have been in Beringia. What we have in Beringia at about the same time is a different industry. And this goes back to some of the work I was doing in central Alaska back in the late 70s in the Nanana Valley in the North Alaska Range. Um, there's another very different looking industry in Alaska, we call this um, the late Roger Powers, who was my advisor at, at the University of Alaska. Um, Roger and I call this the Nainana Complex. Uh, and we suggested it might have some connection with what shows up down south later. But there's something also, something relatively similar. In any case, it doesn't have those, those little wedge-shaped microblade cores, the microblades, that shows up over here in Western Bringe at a place called Ushki, central Sam Kamchatka. Um, and uh, my Russian, most of my Russian colleagues feel this is also a a very separate industry. So the question is, where do these people, who, who made these, who made this stuff? And where do they come from? And uh, I, one, one scenario um, is that, that, that they're the, they're the Beringians. That they are, the, they are an archaeological proxy for the people who we hypothesize then may have been living in this refugium in central Beringia and of course starting to flood here after about 15, 14,000 years ago, uh, who then dispersed just, just like the plants, dispersed to the east, the west, and also the south. Uh, and then, if that's the case, then these would be the credible source for the initial uh, group of Amerindians who come into North America and South America here and very rapidly occupy uh, the rest of the New World. Uh, so that's it. Thank you.